Good morning, everyone. I'm Alexander Larman. I'm the author of a new book, The Crowning Crisis, which is available at most, if not quite, all good bookshops near you, because obviously, sadly, we are in the time of a pandemic, which is why I'm currently sitting in my study talking to you from here, rather than actually being able to address you in person. But nonetheless, this is the first one of these that I've done, and I don't know how many you've attended, but it's a great pleasure to be speaking into the void about the abdication, Edward VIII and all the rest of it as well, and hopefully this will be an interesting and edifying experience for us all. So the book's now been out about a month, and thankfully it's been exceptionally well received. It's had by far the greatest level of publicity that any of my books have had so far. It's had you know, two serialisations in the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Express. It has been Book of the Week in the Times, Book of the Damn Guardian. It's been you know, an absolute honour to have had this subject getting through to so many people. And yet one of the negative reviews, in fact, so far the sole negative review, asked the question, which I think is a very good starting point, why do we need another book about the abdication? And it's a perfectly fair point because we've had so many books that have dealt with what happened in 1936, so many books about the relationship between Edward and Wallace, so many books about Wallace herself, who I think has become a figure of absolute fascination to society. To which I would say, first of all, why don't we need another book about the abdication? Because it, it is a, a story which, although it took place 84 years ago, it speaks to us today with absolute conviction, with absolute fascination. But as we see what happened in that year, but we started off with this man who never wanted to become king, having to become king. And as the year wore on, we saw treachery, we saw betrayal, we saw lust, we saw power, we saw all the things that make society and all the things that make life exciting and dramatic and dangerous writ large across the most grand of global scales that you have nazis you have royalty you have all sorts of things and all sorts of people that we don't normally come into contact with and at times i actually found it a shakespearean story i found that when you've got this narrative you are talking about people on this wider larger scale but what I've wanted to do with The Crown and Crisis was not simply to write a book about pageantry. It's not a book that's designed for people who want to read about what outfit so-and-so was wearing or precisely who was in the court circular on such and such a date. Instead, my greatest influence behind writing it, actually, was the film Dunkirk, which was released a few years ago in the cinema, because I always found the idea of the Dunkirk evacuation something that wouldn't lend itself to a particularly dramatic story. But watching the film, which was literally the most edge of seat, tense experience I could have imagined, I thought, as an approach as to how to tell the story, that really resonated with me, because I was fascinated by the idea with The Crowning Crisis of telling the abdication story as literally a race against time. The idea was going to be that if Edward had remained on the throne, it is more than likely that we would now be talking about the idea of the German invasion of England, or at least the German peace with England. So you have that sense, which I tried explicitly to bring in from the first prologue onwards, of what was at stake and what these people were racing against to do. So the book subtitle, Countdown to the Abdication, was very much that. I wanted to have the idea of a countdown, the idea that we were up against something far, far greater than the idea of simply a love affair between two people, but it was a situation of a true national and international reach. So that was what I wanted to do, and that was why I felt that a new book about the abdication, its time had come, and thankfully my publisher, Weinfeld Nicholson, agreed with me. But initially it started off as another book as well, but I was quite very interested in this character of Sir Walter Monckton, and he was Edward's lawyer and he was his advisor. And I went off to Balliol College archives where his papers are kept and I met his daughter-in-law, Mariana, who's the sole surviving immediate member of his family. And I did a lot of research into Sir Walter, who was a fascinating man who achieved a huge number of things in his life. He was involved in partition in India. He was the chairman of Midland Bank. He was the chairman of the MCC and things like that. And he was a really interesting man. I would have loved to have you know, seen a book written about him, but I couldn't help thinking that while I was doing the research, he was the figure. He, the abdication loomed large in his life. And because of that, the abdication loomed large in everyone's lives. Because obviously it wasn't a time that could just be described as normality. I mean, there was never another instance in English history 
of a king voluntarily abdicating his throne. So we have to look at it in those terms. We have to look at it in terms of something utterly unprecedented, where the king himself was not out of the top draw, either morally, intellectually, or on any other level. So it fell to people around him to pick up the pieces and to actually make sure that the abdication could take place in a civilised and legal way. And Walter Monckton, as I said, is a fascinating man, and I'm sure that someday somebody will write a great book about him. There's really a Lord Birkenhead biography of him in existence. But I realised, as I did more and more research into the book, that it couldn't just be a Walter Monckton biography, but it actually had to focus on the whole range of socialites, politicians, Nazis, and ordinary people as well. And this is something that I found in, in my research, that you've got to be able to go to all of these different places, and you've got to be able to go through the letters that ordinary people wrote to each other, to the king, to the politicians about the abdication. And of course, nobody is neutral when it comes to the topic of the abdication. Everyone has an opinion about Edward VIII. Everyone has an opinion about Wallace Simpson. And certainly my own opinions of both of them have changed while I was doing my research and the writing. Edward VIII, when he was Prince of Wales, could be described as the most universally popular figure of his day. And nobody would think that was an exaggeration. He was seen as somebody who was accessible. He was seen as somebody who was essentially like a film star. He had a glamour to him that previous rulers, including his father, George V, simply hadn't had. He was somebody who could connect with a common man. He was somebody who was, he was known to go to nightclubs. He was known to, you know, like a drink or two. And so superficially, the idea of him becoming king and the first non-Victorian king as well was a very exciting one. The idea of there's going to be this modernistic, modern looking figure who was actually going to be saying to his, his, his people, this is kingship in the 20th century. I am not rule bound the way my ancestors were. So that was a very exciting idea, but unfortunately Edward was spectacularly ill-equipped for it on any moral, intellectual or social level. Because what he was, was I say fairly explicitly in the book, that he was neither a good man nor a good king. But even as Prince of Wales, he was regarded with fear by his courtiers who knew that he was unreliable and knew that he was somebody who was li liable to pursue his own interests and his own enthusiasms far more than he was actually able to do his duty. And as Tommy Lassells wrote, Tommy Lassells being, of course, immortalised in The Crown, a fantastic performance there, he was always involved in a series of grand affairs and, to my cost, a series of petit affairs as well. So you have the idea that even before he met Wallace Simpson, Edward was involved in a series of affairs, often married women. He was somebody because he was good looking and, of course, because he was Prince of Wales. He was able to have anyone he wanted. But the problem was, was that there was a sexual dysfunction to him, which was, I mean, it's still not entirely clear. I think I go further into it than any other biographer because there are these letters which exist, which essentially talk about his desire to be dominated sexually. And he wrote to one of his mistresses that he could get abominably soft and spoilt, and she really had to be nasty and rough with him so that he didn't just end up being a pampered little man. And of course, his nickname, the, the Little Man as well, has had overtones, and people have often speculated as to what this meant, but it's not for me to spell it out. However, when Edward met Wallace in 1931, Wallace Simpson was, and is, one of the most discussed and photographed women of her time. She came from very inauspicious circumstances. She was the daughter of a boarding house proprietor from Baltimore. And by the time she met Edward, she'd already had one traumatic divorce and was on her second husband. And she also spent some time in China, in, in the so-called Sing Sing houses of Shanghai. And it was speculated that while she was out there, she learned the Oriental arts, which Again, we're not sure what those involved. I mean, there's said to be this China dossier, which is made up of the activities she said to participate in. I think the only thing you can say for absolute certain is that anyone, any Westerner who's taking part in Sing Sing houses would have been privy to a variety of rather extreme sexual acts, a lot of which was dealing around sexual, the, the delay of sexual gratification. So if you imagine Wallace as being somebody who definitely knew what she was doing, when she met Edward, there was no initial chemistry between the two of them. There was politeness, but little more. But as time went on, they spent more and more time together, until by 1934, they were almost certainly lovers. Edward denied that they were lovers for most of his, most of the time before they married. 
this was a lie. This was a lie, pure and simple. There's all these descriptions in private documents written by his courtiers when he, he even said to his father, George V, who explicitly described Wallace as his mistress, he would say, I swear on my honour to you, she is not my mistress and I've not had a sexual relationship with her, even as he called one of his previous mistresses a filthy beast, which shows the kind of man in his attitude towards women that he was. But my attitude towards Wallace, while I, before I started writing the book, was one I suppose this has been the received attitude for years, that she was the woman who brought down the monarchy, that she was self-obsessed, that she was somebody who cared nothing for any kind of decency, that she was just somebody who was out for herself and nothing else. But as I did more research, as I went through her, she wrote, well, she ghost wrote this autobiography called The Heart Has Its Reasons, and there's various other things as well that we see about her. I began to feel much more sympathetic towards her because actually you look at her now and she was essentially a woman in a man's world. She was trying to live on her wits. She was trying to make the most of what she had, which certainly wasn't good looks. It was intelligence, it was wit, and it was an ability to manipulate a situation to her own advantage. And so from that perspective, I mean, my book is certainly not a hagiography of Wallace Simpson, but it's much more sympathetic towards her than previous biographers have been. Because I feel that we've had too much in our society of people laying into the, the woman and, blame, and blaming the woman for all the failings. And so I would instead put much of the blame on Edward VIII, both personally and morally, because he wasn't a stupid man, he was a limited man. And I think that if you understand Edward as somebody who didn't have the ambition of certainly his father, who wanted to see Britain as this as the country that he always imagined it would be. I mean, Edward was not interested in that. He had some vague social ideas. I mean, he went to see miners in Wales at one point in his reign, and he was seeing these filthy and squalid conditions they were living in. And he was appalled by it. And he said, something must be done. And this attracted some press coverage, but of course, nothing was done. Because the fact is, is that it's very hard if you're a king to have any kind of ability to tell your prime ministers what to do. So I was starting from the perspective of while I was writing the book, first of all, of wanting to write a book about the abdication in a new way, but also in terms of telling stories that hadn't been told before. And what I was particularly lucky with was that when I was at the Bailey College archives, I was researching the story of Walter Monkton. There's, just, there's lots and lots of documents in the Monkton archives, which are, some of them are quite revealing, some of them are actually if I was to write a subsequent book to this, I would hopefully be able to include some of that material because it details the breakdown of the relationship between Edward VIII and George VI, mainly about money, but we'll come to that in a moment. But the single piece of, the single most amazing thing that I found in the Bailey College archive is in fact a document which has attracted the most publicity of anything that I found in the book. And what happened is that in July, 19, July the 16th, 1936, a few months after Edward had succeeded to the throne, there was an assassination attempt on him by a man called George McMahon. And every other previous biographer had dismissed this as being essentially a non-story, because what had been said at the time and had been agreed on subsequently was that McMahon had been this drunkard and this itinerant who'd gone about and had had a grievance against the, against the Home Secretary, Sir John Simon. And in order to have his grievance publicly recognised, he went to the trooping of the colour and threw a, a, a loaded gun at the king's horse. This gun failed to go off. McMahon was arrested, sentenced to a 12-month sentence for disturbing the peace. And that was the end of that. You know, these things happen. Most rulers have had at least one incident like that occur, occur in their lives. But finding this autobiographical document written by McMahon and then going into the National Archives and looking at all of the MI5 material, I began to find out that actually McMahon was an MI5 informant who was working both for MI5 and for the Italian embassy at the time. And what became very interesting was it became abundantly clear that there was actually a conspiracy going on both between these disaffected communists and fellow sympathizers and so on to stage either an assassination attempt on Edward or at the very least to stage a high profile news gathering story that would show some interest in their grievances. But also, and this was where I think things got really interesting in this year's coverage, it seemed abundantly clear that McMahon and MI5 were this very odd 
relationship, this old symbiotic relationship, because he was giving them a lot of information, which they could claim was undoubtedly accurate. But the second that it became obvious that he was going to have to go to trial, they did every single thing they could behind the scenes to make sure that he was discredited, that even his defence barrister, St. John Hutchinson, was giving the most lousy account of a defence for him. And it became very obvious very quickly that MI5 might well have wanted Edward to be assassinated, but they would either have literally put him up to it, or more likely, they would have sat back as he attempted to commit this assassination and done nothing. So you have this completely febrile atmosphere at the time where the idea that you, you have the security services essentially being complicit in the assassination of, of the king. I mean, only a few months into the reign. And so you have to say, well, why did this happen? Why were they so keen to see the end of Edward? And the answer has to be because Edward was a, a security risk. He was always, he'd had a good relationship with the Germans. In fact, there's a story about how he, he gave a talk to, to the German embassy in 1935. He was the first king or the first even politician to have done so. And he said essentially, well, now all that unpleasantness of 1914 to 1918 is behind us. I hope we can all have a really good relationship in the future. Given that most of the people there had lost family in World War I, this was incredibly tactless and incredibly stupid as a thing to say. But Edward was never somebody who was very interested in what other people had to say. So you have this idea that when he became a king after his father's death at the beginning of 1936, he, was, he never wanted to be king. He was entirely unsuited to king, to be king. His younger brother, Bertie, who later became George VI, was a much more suitable figure in that he was interested in duty. He was interested in the idea of actually doing what he should have done. But Edward was just essentially selfish and in his relationship with Wallace, utterly consumed by this lust for her. And that's not going to be the best possible way of becoming a ruler. And so I really want to dig into that. I want to dig into this relationship, not just between the two of them, which I think has been covered before, possibly not in the detail that I've covered it, but also in terms of a story. But I want to dig into the feelings and thoughts of other people. Because one particularly interesting person who I found was Alec Harding, who was the King's private secretary. And Harding was somebody who kept a very candid memoir of his impressions of the King, who he was working with very closely most of his brief reign. And Harding absolutely hated Edward. He believed that Edward was venal. He believed that Edward was weak. He believed he was entirely unsuited to being King. And he, in his own way, tried to frustrate every single thing that the King did. And it's interesting because Harding was far from alone in this regard. I mean, he was a man of principle. He believed that the monarchy was the most important thing in British society and that if you had somebody who would let it down you ran the risk of absolute chaos and absolute awfulness. So that was very much an under-narrative that I wanted to explore throughout the book, the relationship between Alec Harding and Edward VIII, but then there were so many other stories that I wanted to get in there. I wanted to have opinions of contemporary writers, I mean in the book for instance there's a bit of Osbert Sitt Yes, Os Osbert Sitwell was a bit of Evelyn War. Didn't include Virginia Woolf, although she wrote very interestingly about the abdication, because ultimately you can only fit in so many literary figures. But it was an event throughout the year that you could see over and over again that people, it became a dominating and fascinating fact for most people of the year that, first of all, they had this king whose affair of Wallace Simpson was not being recorded in any of the press, it was being essentially kept secret. And then after that, you have the idea that when it did finally become public, all hell broke loose. But what I wanted to do before we get to the final Ragnarok Rock of December 1936 was talk about some of the more amusing things that I found in my research. After the assassination attempt in July, for instance, Edward went on a cruise on, on a boat called the Narlin, and he went off with various figures, including Diana and Duff Cooper, the socialite and her politician husband. Diana Cooper wrote this wonderful series of letters to her friend Conrad Russell, and actually writing this chapter was lovely for me because I was able to write something that was much more like sort of Nancy Mitford's social comedy. And you see the idea of the king going off on essentially a romantic holiday with his mistress, with around a dozen guests, but because he's the king, they can't travel incognito. They've got to have destroyers, they've got to have tens of thousands of people at every port shouting hurrah for the lovers and things like that. And not a word of this has been reported to the English papers because the all-powerful press magnet Lord Beaverbrook had, in, in response to a request from Edward, had completely blanked out any kind of coverage 
relation to anything to do with Edward and Wallace. So people were simply not allowed to know what their king was doing or that Wallace was his mistress, because this would have been felt to have been so outrageous and so likely to have affected the course of English history that it simply wasn't reported. And you think about today and you think about what would have happened if we were having a similar situation. You think we have social media, we have a very interested news media who want to report every kind of story as soon as it appears. We have 24 hour rolling news. The idea that you simply couldn't report a story like that would seem extraordinary. And yet on the other hand, we have people who believe in conspiracy theories. We believe, I mean, just to completely change the subject of the second, you look at all the Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell stuff. And you look at the amount of people who would say their stories that are not being reported and they may or may not be right. But on the other hand, we are still in, in an age where we want answers. We want to know things. We want to have secrets uncovered. And so if you go back to 1936, people remained in ignorance, even as these rumours began to circulate. Because after all, if you have a King of England and you're on a romantic holiday with your mistress in, in Europe, and there are tens of thousands of people watching you, you're not going to be able to get away with being incognito. You're not going to get away with nobody talking about this. And so the lack of press coverage essentially all comes down to Beaverbrook and his peers, and the influence that they had. But the press were not happy about being silenced. I mean, they were saying throughout the reign, there's a series of letters going to and from very influential newspaper editors, essentially saying, we know what the biggest story of the year is. We have been muzzled. The British press should not be muzzled. When can re we report it? So essentially, when it finally was reported at the beginning of December, there was a speech by Bishop Blunt of Leeds. And he was a, a well-meaning, slightly unworldly figure who was worried about the lack of spiritual interest on Edward's part because he was due to have his coronation in May 1937. And so Blunt delivered this sermon in which he said that Edward would have to pray for the Lord's help when it came to the special issue, which is currently diverting him. The special issue was, in Blunt's idea, his lack of faith. But the newspapers took it to mean his affair with Wallace Simpson. And since it had essentially been reported in open court, as it were, that was when the dam broke. So you have to imagine that throughout 1936, you've got a difficult situation in Britain. You've got the idea that war seemed more and more likely with Hitler's territorial advances, with Hitler's ideas of what he wanted to do to Europe. And you also have the idea that people were frightened. There was a great sense in the country of a lack of stability. The Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin was quite an aged figure by then. He was somebody who, he wasn't a well man. He'd had to have a couple of months off after his after summer parliamentary session because he had had he was so exhausted by the demands of his role that he'd essentially been unable to govern so you have this idea of britain was very febrile time when rumors were swirled about where scandal was always dogging people and i suppose a question that one has to ask is could edward ever have been a king i mean could he ever have stayed on the throne or was it always going to be something that was going to be doomed and Having assessed all the evidence, having thought about it while I was writing a book and thought about it since, I can't see any way that he could ever have had a long and successful reign because he was never suited to it. He was never a man who was happy with the demands of kingship, but much more so than that, he was utterly obsessed by Wallace. And what's been interesting is I was talking to Dan Jones, the historian with whom I did a podcast, and Dan essentially said to me, do you think that the reason why he had to abdicate was because of his role as Church of England? And that's the standard line on the abdication is taught in schools, that Edward could not remain a king if he was to marry a divorced woman. And this is probably true on a technical level, but you have to set this against the other fact, which was that the government would have had to have fallen because Edward was a constitutional monarch. And the nature of a constitutional monarch is that you have to listen to what your government says and you have to obey their commands. Because otherwise, I mean, since Charles I, this has always been a rather vexed issue in terms of how much responsibility the king has and how much influence his politicians have. But if you choose to ignore your government altogether, then you're going to run the risk that you essentially are operating on your own terms as a almost a dictator. And Lord Beaverbrook was aware of this. And he was aware of the fact that for the first time in British history, 
there was a possibility that you could have actually had an unelected political party emerging, which was loosely known as the King's Party. And this party would have been devoted to one thing and one thing alone. It would have been to have got Stanley Baldwin and, and the coalition government away because Beaverbrook and Baldwin hated each other with an absolute passion. So Beaverbrook had a personal interest in making sure that this would happen. And that a government would instead come to the fore, hence the King's Party, which would have seen Edward remain on the throne. The problem is that most of the people who would have been involved in the King's Party, with the possible exception of Winston Churchill, who was being highlighted as a potential leader, were fascist and Nazi sympathizers. And one figure who was particularly prominent in 1936, especially towards the end, was the leader of the British Union of Fascists, Oswald Mosley. And there's a great story actually about how Mosley led a demonstration in East London in support of Edward VIII. And at the end, this is the contemporary resonance, this is so utterly uh, scary and hilarious at the same time. He ended it by saying, let us go away to Westminster and sweep away the old women by vote of the people, make Britain great again. And you think, yes, I wonder where I've heard that subsequently. But essentially, this is what the abdication was all about. It was all about these tense relationships with people. It was all about the way that somebody like Mosley could seriously believe for a few moments that he had a chance of being involved in this neo-fascist government, where the king would have been a puppet ruler, able to carry on being married to Wallace and turn the other way, as Hitler could have achieved what he wanted. So one of the things I was very keen to do with the book was to have the character of Joachim von Ribbentrop, who was the ambassador, the German ambassador to Britain at the time, as being a very prominent figure. Because von Ribbentrop, was, he was a former champagne salesman who was very good at flattering Hitler. And he came to England as its ambassador with the explicit command to bring about an alliance with England. So that when the final reckoning could happen, that England would be a neutral party. And the relationship between him and Edward was always one that Edward, in his subsequent Ghost Written Memoir, denied he'd had a close friendship with Ribbentrop. But if you go to the Royal Archives in Windsor Castle, you can find these endless, endless accounts of meetings between the two of them and an excessive closeness and an excessive interest in what Edward was, do was, was up to and what the Germans were up to and so on. And of course, for a country which knew that it was on the verge of war and very much didn't want to have another war, you can see the idea that Edward was a pitifully unsuited king, because not only was he sympathetic towards the other side, possibly more so than his own, but you needed the country to be able to rally behind somebody. You needed people to be able to, to say, this man, our king, is somebody that we can trust, that we can actually look up to, that we can respect. And I think that a lot of people felt that Edward was not that person. And I, what you have to see of the subsequent application as being is this enormous disappointment. And I think that Edward was somebody who, by the time that the abdication came about in December, by the time that the stories broke in the press, he'd retreated to Fort Belvedere, which was his private home just, in, just outside of Windsor Great Park. And he was somebody who he essentially hunkered down with, with Wallace, with Walter Monckton and a few others. And so, so you have this opposition, you have this opposition between Edward as king, who was allegedly you know, taking drugs and drinking too much, where this has been hotly disputed by both people involved in it and by historians since. You have Wallace, who eventually left the country to head to France because she was so terrified and horrified by all the things that had been happening to her since she more or less fraudulently obtained her divorce in October 1936. You have a few people who I think are the heroes of the book, people like Walter Monckton and actually Stanley Baldwin, who can make sure that the application could actually happen because it was a hugely fraught constitutional issue. It was something that had never been done before. There was no precedent for it. There was no possibility that you could simply say, I am going to abdicate as king. Because as before he could, I mean, Edward thought that he was able as king just to say, right, well, I've decided I don't want to be king anymore, so I'm not going to be. Because a mistake that both he and Wallace had made was that he was not a figure like, say, the American president who had this unilateral ability to make that kind of decision. Instead, he was somebody who was, if not quite a puppet, certainly somebody who had to work closely with his cabinet, with politicians, with his advisors. That he refused to do so meant that he was ultimately a doomed figure. So by the time the abdication itself came, that gloriously awful or gloriously great day, depending on whichever way you look at it, full of drama, his great speech to the nation, the tension of it all. Writing about that kind of thing was, to me, fascinating. I mean, I 
thought I frivolously complained. I frivolously compared it to it being a bit like writing about a crucifixion. But on the other hand, there is that sense of drama. There is that sense of something amazing and something absolutely seismic happening. And I think that Edward was somebody who, it wasn't till the last moment that he was aware of what he'd actually done. It wasn't till the last minute that he could actually see as he was leaving Fort Belvedere for the last time, the absolute sacrifices that he had made for his love for Wallace. And she didn't share that love for him. She realised that she was in over her head. She realised that she would always be dogged by publicity. She'd always be dogged by people being obsessed by her. And she tried to get out. She wrote letters to him in which she said, I don't want to be part of this anymore. I don't feel that I can be your, your, your mistress or, or your wife. And on one occasion after their cruise, she decided after seeing the press coverage in foreign papers of her, it was just too much. And she, and she wrote to him to try and call the relationship off. And Edward's reaction was to threaten suicide unless she joined him at Balmoral for a, Christmas, for a September holiday. So she had to go up anyway. And over and over again, you see this. You see that he could behave in the most histrionic, the most absurd of terms if he didn't get what he wanted. And it's a really disturbing thing to write about somebody who is obviously, I mean, mentally deranged is putting it too strongly, but there was one incident where Lord Wigram, who was his former private secretary, actually said, we have to be prepared to be able to certify him if needs be and have him you know, declared insane because otherwise we might have a second George III on our hands. And certainly, you know, there have been constant, not complaints, but certain hints about mental instability in the royal family. And if Edward wasn't mad, he was certainly somebody who could be accused of behaving in a mad way. I mean, towards the actual abdication, he was described as being as if he was going to go on holiday. Again, I think there's a lack of conviction there and a lack of being able to really take on board what's happening to him. But I think for a lot of people who are interested in the story, We'll also be looking at the present day parallels because what was very funny for me in this absurd year is that in January, Harry and Meghan helpfully staged their own quasi abdication, which of course means that the issues of abdication which we are facing have to be put in some kind of perspective. And the question I've been asked on anything else, more, than, more than any other, which I'll try and answer now before anyone else wants to ask it, is do you think that Harry and Meghan and Edward and Wallace is the same story all over again? And on the one hand, I would say no, because obviously Harry was never going to be king. There was never going to be the possibility that there was a serious constitutional threat. And I think that Meghan is somebody who has been exceptionally good at trying to manipulate the media. She's been very interested in being this very public figure. As Wallace was somebody who had no interest in it whatsoever until after the abdication. She would have avoided the media and thought the press were essentially vulgar people who should be dispensed with. So from that perspective, I think they're very different. I think that Harry is a much better person than Edward. Certainly parallels. I mean, both of them have military service. I think that military service has been a defining feature for them both. And I think that they've both, you know, had the label of playboy attached to them but i think that harry has a decency and a conviction to him that edward simply never had so those are similarities and differences but on the other hand in both cases you have the treatment of by the media of megan of treatment of wallace is very similar both of them of course being american divorcees both of them as being seen as the dominant partner in the relationship and i can certainly have a great deal of sympathy with that because you can see that a lot of the complaints and a lot of the accusations leveled at megan you go back 80 odd years it's exactly the same towards wallace which implies that our preoccupations in both our media and our society have not changed all that much and have not come on all that much the racism that has been allegedly directed towards megan i think you can definitely see its anti-americanism towards wallace but also a lot of the accusations of being grasping of being some people who, who want money who want power who want status yeah i think you can say that was probably as true of edward and wallace as it has been of harry and megan you can say that I mean, certainly Harry and Meghan are making all of this very loud noise about their charity endeavours, and Edward and Wallace don't have the slightest interest in charitable endeavours. They're much more interested in living for themselves. And certainly you see a conspicuous lack of any public service that occurred after the abdication. But I think ultimately, the thing that you can bear in mind, and I find fascinating to explore now, and I think we'll always find fascinating to explore, is that royalty is not something which you can just pick up and give away. You don't you can stop being king, you can stop being, well, whatever Harry stopped being, I mean, that's a funny thing, he's rather kept on to it, he's held on to his title even he's, as he's abandoned his responsibilities. But you can't stop 
the circumstances of your birth. You can't just go away and become this anonymous figure. You are essentially always going to be tied in to a series of expectations and amount of interest, which is going to go on for the rest of your life. And whether you regard that as a blessing or you regard that as a curse, I think actually one thing that's very interesting is you look at George VI and of course his, his wife Elizabeth, who became the Queen Mother, and there's enormous parallels between them and between you know, William and, and Kate Middleton, because what you have today is you have a sense of this rather boring, rather dutiful figure, and his probably rather more intelligent wife, who can get things done, who is very much aware of the requirements of, of, of the role, how you come across as accessible, how people are actually going to, to love you. And if you go the other way, and you end up trying to be like Edward and Wallace, or indeed Harry and Meghan, and you have this very, very defined public persona, it makes it far harder for the average person to put their own beliefs and their own lives onto you. Because we look at Harry and Meghan now living in their $20 million mansion or whatever it is in California. And none of us can think of, well, perhaps some of us can, but I certainly can't look at that and feel any sense of understanding what it must be like. And so when you hear them saying, oh, it's been so awful, we're so just discriminated against, you think, but you don't understand what the average person thinks. You don't have that, any interest in what the average person thinks. And I think that's the same thing as with Edward Ope, to be honest with you. I think that he was somebody who had this great superficial connection with the average man and the average woman, both before his reign and during it, less so after it. But it, he was utterly removed from the cares and concerns of his people. And I think for the ultimate reason why the application had to happen was because he had gambled on the idea that his own charm and his own popularity would be enough to see him through and that eventually he'd be allowed to marry Wallace. And like all gambles made without a sufficient knowledge of what the odds are, it was always going to fail. And so the crowning crisis has been my attempt to unpick a very fascinating, a very nuanced story to bring in contemporary residences where they've been appropriate, but also to try and find parallels between things that have happened subsequently. I mean, something that fascinated me while I was writing the book was Brexit. And so I've inserted a few careful allusions here and there, just from, you know, hopefully my reader's amusement. But obviously, now that we're in the midst of this global pandemic, you know, even if it is receding slightly, I'm still talking to you said so from my computer off and then face to face, we have seen a completely different world. And in that completely different world, we, we value, I think, decency, honesty, openness and communication more than we ever have before. And so it is salutary to go back and look at the abdication and look at the heroes, look at the villains, look at the drama involved in it and think, how could it have been done differently and should it have happened at all? And I'd like to answer your questions if possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Alex. That was a fascinating thing. Oh, we've got a question. That was quick. Uh, okay. um, from Paul Campion. We've got two actually. Um, do you think that Wallace really wanted to marry the king or was she on a downward spiral and would have really preferred to stay with Mr Simpson? Well, Ernest Simpson's this figure who I actually I try to explore it in my book a bit more than other biographers have because on the one hand, he's been seen as the most famous cuckold in history, the man who would literally lay down his wife for his king. But on the other hand, he's this figure who Diana Cooper records this evening with him at Blenheim Palace, while he was still married to Wallace, going outside and trying to, to seduce her. So he wasn't just some wilting violet sitting there not doing anything. But in terms of Wallace wanting to remain with him, she wrote him letters for years after her divorce, some of which are quite affectionate and quite loving, saying about how much she misses him and referring, you know, to, to, to the Duke of Windsor, who she's married to as Peter Pan in, in a derogatory way. And in terms of whether she loved him, no, I don't think she did. I think she liked the idea of the obsession, well, not the obsession, she liked the idea of the way in which Edward was besotted by her. She liked the way in which she could manipulate that. She liked the gifts. She liked the way that she could have this wonderful, lavish lifestyle she could never have imagined otherwise. But she liked the, she liked the good things of life. She liked the opportunity to have expensive jewellery. She liked the opportunity to go to wonderful hotels and wonderful cruises and things like that. But as soon as she realised that she was in over her head, she wanted to get rid of him straight away and she was unable to. And I think that was her great tragedy in life. Oh, fascinating. Um, we have another question. Um, did the abdication advance or delay the onset of the Second World War, do you think? 
Um, well, there's two ways of looking at that. The first way of looking at that is if we hadn't had the abdication, Edward would have remained sympathetic towards Hitler. I mean, something I always like to say is that he was, in a very literal sense, a Nazi sympathizer. He had great sympathy with Hitler's aims, he had great sympathy with what Germany were trying to do. And I do not believe that he would have stood up under any circumstances and tried to talk against Hitler. He would have always been somebody who was interested in the idea of there being a German-British peace accord. But if you remove Britain from the possibility of the Second World War, would Hitler have been encouraged to, to act quicker? Would there have been a, a, a Munich Agreement? And I, I think to myself, there probably wouldn't have been a Munich Agreement because the chances of Chamberlain having been Prime Minister are relatively low. It's probably more likely to have been Halifax. And Halifax was somebody who was more interested in, in peace. So it's very likely that if Edward had remained king, there would never have been war with Germany. But there would also have then been the gradual... Uh, annexation of various aspects of British life, various aspects of British independent life. So it's perfectly possible that, yes, Edward would have remained as king, we might have nominally had our own government, but we could have been like Vichy France, we could have been people who were allowed to have a certain degree of freedom all, all under the auspices of a German superstate. Uh, I've got two more. Um... Oh, this will kind of ties in, I guess, as well. If Edward hadn't abdicated and remained King, would he have been deposed by the government, do you reckon? Ah, no government is able to depose the king. If they had been able to depose the king, they undoubtedly would have done so. There's a good story, actually, of Tommy Lassels and Stanley Baldwin, years before Edward became king, talking about the likelihood of his becoming king. Lassell said, God help me, but I, you know, I hope he falls off his horse and breaks his neck before he becomes king. And Bolton says, you know, so do I, so do I. So if it had been up purely to the government, it's quite likely that they would have found some way for him to be forced off the throne and, and for George VI to become king. But it wasn't purely up to the government. This is, of course, the tension between the, the, the politics and royalty, but you can't simply have a situation where the king tells his politicians what to do, or his politicians tell the king what to do. But he couldn't have been forced off. I mean, what eventually happened was as close to him being forced off the throne as you could have got. It was, Edward was given the ability to believe that he was in charge of his own abdication because he wasn't because the timing circumstances and situation were entirely dictated by his government and of course he did go into exile this is of course the strange thing that it's very hard for us to understand the concept of exile when we look at Harry and Meghan that's not exile the same way that Edward and Wallace had to have it because they are free to return to England whenever they want. I mean, obviously they have to brave both press intrusion and one can imagine a certain foie from the rest of the royal family, but they ha they're not in a situation as Edward was where he actually had to beg for permission to be allowed back into the country. And so, you know, until the end of his brother's life, he was more or less fated not to be allowed back to Britain, except for most short and perfunctory of trips and even until his death in 1972 he never lived in Britain again he was always living in France and although he had the odd visit where he was allowed to return back he was very much kept at arm's length. Um, um, how much do you think that George V's will leaving Nothing to Edward was a key issue. Money was, it, in essence, one of the key deciders, was it not? Well, this has been something that I think has Edward's misunderstanding of the will has been this weird issue in his psyche and in this weird issue in history that's happened since. George V did not leave Edward nothing in his will because he was cutting him out or anything like that. George V left him nothing in his will because he had the Duchy of Cornwall. The Duchy of Cornwall was a hugely lucrative, hugely valuable investment, which actually gave Edward something like a million pounds in cash and in property. Edward, of course, lied. And one of the key issues between him and his younger brother when he abdicated was that he claimed he was poor, that he needed to have this annual allowance of £25,000 that was made to him. And this was an absolute lie. He was wealthy beyond the wildest dreams of most of his subjects. It hadn't been for the fact that he was giving Wallace gifts. I mean, he, he gave her jewellery one Christmas worth around £100,000, which is a 
staggering, staggering amount. I, mean, I don't know how many millions that would be now, but you have to see this in terms of it being completely and utterly absurd in terms of the amounts of things that he was being given. So yes, he wasn't given a formal legacy in the will, but he didn't need to be given a formal legacy in the will. But actually something that he did quite well was to sow the seed that he had been mistreated by his father, but he shouldn't have been given his due. And so that's why it's a fascinating issue. Um, and sort of follows on, it's, I suppose, that um, whether he saw, um, whether King George saw, the V saw um, any doubts, or had any doubts as to Edward's suitability for kingship, but I suppose if the will it isn't a remark of how, what he thought about his son, I suppose the question is, did he himself doubt um, Edward's suitability for kingship? George V once said in a moment of anger and panic, I hope that my son never inherits the throne and I hope that nothing gets between Bertie and, and Lilibet. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I think it was great. Yeah, no, I yeah. like that. Um, I think there's the, just one last question. Um, you mentioned the crown a couple of times, but um, somebody says, in the crown there was a wonderful scene where the Queen takes Edward to task over his conduct in the run-up to and during the war um, made wonderful telly I remember that scene it was great um, do you think anything like this ever happened in reality I think The Crown is an outstanding TV series I think especially the first two series one of the best things I've seen on TV ever and I think that one of, one of the reasons why I was so keen to write the book was to appeal to the kind of audience of people who were bound up in the drama, the excitement and the intrigue of it. And I mean, that, that even my book has literally got the crown in its title. It's not a coincidence, I can assure you of that. So for, yeah, from that perspective, I think that obviously the writer Peter Morgan is somebody who's using creative license. He's bringing his own stories and his own ideas into it. But I do feel that an awful lot of it is based on fact. And actually the episode that deals explicitly with Edward's Nazi sympathies. Now, this isn't in the purview of this book, but if I was to write another book, and I was going to deal with that subject, I'd be very interested to explore that because I think that Edward's relationship with Hitler in 1937, when he and Wallace went to Germany and was seen saluting with him and things like that, I mean, it was not something that was very clever to do, which is, you either put this down to ignorance and the complete lack of any sense of diplomacy, or you think it's completely the, op the, the, op the opposite of that. You think actually it's somebody who isn't as stupid as you think, who's deliberately doing this to ally himself with the enemies of his former country. And you think to yourself, well, why would you do that? Is there money in it for you? Status, have you been promised of that? But if you, you know, if you join with us and we take over England, you'll go back as king? I mean, that's a question. And you know, we, we still don't know the, the true answers to that. So that's going to be so fascinating to explore whether it's me or somebody else doing it. Because there's never been, you know, the final word on that yet. That's okay. One question just uh, finally just slipped in. So we'll just do that one. Um, would you say that Churchill did well to bounce back as spectacularly as he did in 1940 after his intervention in 1936? Yeah, I mean, we barely touched on Churchill today, and actually he's a figure who, it's always very odd, you know, because writing a book like this, you find yourself writing, Churchill said this, Hitler said that, and occasionally you have to sit to him and say, Churchill, Hitler, these enormous figures, and of course when we're not actually the protagonists of your book, it's really important to try and keep them in some sort of perspective. Churchill was un un unfailingly supportive of Edward VIII, he believed that he should be allowed to remain as king, he felt that what was being done to him was essentially a stitch-up. And I try and present him as sympathetically and warmly of a book as I can, because obviously he was acting from principle. He was not in, interested in Beaverbrook in terms of just power. He wanted to see the king remain on the throne. He wanted to see the, the ability that Edward could have had to have been allowed to marry Wallace, I mean, his precise words were, let the king have his duty. And he wanted it to be done in, in as straightforward a way as possible. But the problem was, was that Stanley Baldwin, who was nowhere near the politician that Churchill was, was still quite a strong presence. And he was also somebody who had the support of, of Parliament. And there's, you know, there's this fascinating story between him, the, the two of them that Churchill was speaking to Baldwin about the abdication and he lost his temper. He, he yelled at Baldwin, you won't be happy till you've broken him, will you? And after that moment where he's completely lost his temper in this really undignified, really unseemly way, he left the Commons and thought his political career was over. And in fact, you know, from 36, 37, 38 onwards. I mean, Churchill really was this voice in the wilderness speaking about the evils of Germany and the need for rearmament. 
And it's more likely that, you know, in other circumstances, he probably would have gone off into an autumnal retirement. He would have had his house in Chartwell, long lunches at the Carlton and so on. But events, dear boy, events. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Thank you so much for, for that, that was brilliant. If you'd like to read more, um, signed copies are available via Blackwells and the link is in the chat box here and it's also on the webpage. Um, but yeah, I think that's all for today. Thank you so much, Alexander. Fantastic, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. It's been really interesting for me. It's been the first time I've done something like this and it's been a really nice experience. So it's uh, great. Okay. Buy the book. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank Bye. You. Bye.